I can give a little bit of background as to why I've come to really thinking about the enabling environment. And it's because of my own uh, reflexivity, my own personal history. Um, I started uh, working as a, a ballet dancer um, and I was trained, and I use the word trained, as a ballet dancer in an elite ballet school. And during that training, I became a, a body as commodity. I was very disciplined. Um, I pushed the boundaries of pain and pleasure. And um, I engaged in a performance career where um, you know, I, was, I was engaging in ballet and I was enjoying ballet. Um, but I didn't feel very creative. Um, I was told what to do, how to do it, when to do it, how long to do it for. Um, and as I became more kind of mature and more adult, um, I started to question uh, why I wanted to engage in something that was actually quite painful emotionally and uh, physically. Um, and uh, so I started working with lots of kind of new independent dance work um, and started choreographing. And in doing that, I kind of found these sort of creative ways of working, which became, you know, wholly interesting to me. Um, and alongside that, one of the, the kind of biggest areas which I had to learn to do was learn how to play. And um, I became very playful and engaged in making work through this kind of play-based process um, where I would choose uh, different stimuli, you know, looking at Brian's work here made me think very much about the kind of artifacts I could use for playfulness in creating work. Um, and so that was kind of the starting point for why I became very interested in how I was enabled to become creative. So um, along the journey, um, I worked in uh, different settings and contexts. Um, I worked as a touring dancer in contemporary work. Um, I also worked in school-based settings with very young children in early years, uh, working in play um, with uh, adults and uh, with secondary age adolescents. And uh, came into higher education. Um, Alongside that, I was always very interested in literature and narrative, and um, I even found myself teaching English here at the university uh, at some point in that career as well. Um, so now I'm using mu music and performing arts, and I run the dance programmes. I'm very, very interested when I have a group of adolescents that come to me, how I'm going to work on enabling their creativity. Many of the students come in, as with all of us, with particular um, personal histories, embodied identities, ways of thinking about the world. And they make connections to ways of thinking about the world based on those histories. Um, so many of my students, for example, are we there? No. Um, <laughs> many of my students, for example, come in, um, often from a sort of BTEC background, and um, they have particular perceptions then of um, how they're going to see the world, how they think the dance degree is going to work, they're also um, embodied through a popular culture and the other histories that they are involved in. So it's not just this sort of academic history they come from, from sort of BTEC background. It's also um, their family history and their history of relating to the world through this whole wealth of popular culture. And much of what they come with is this kind of didactic approach. They expect to be told what to do, a bit like I had been expected to told, be told what to do. And it's quite tricky then to start developing an environment which helps them think for themselves a bit more. Um, and they come in as 18-year-olds and we kind of expect that they are adults. And of course, they're, they're still adolescents. Um, and so they think in, in that sort of adolescent way. Um, a lot of the girls that I get are what we might call kind of stereotypical good girls. Um, so they may have been through um, doing vocational ballet, tap, modern training. Um, they may have uh, done pretty well at school, um, but they, they've been told that they're pretty good at dance, and many of them don't see themselves as being very academic, and they've chosen this practical dance subject because they're not really very academic, but they'd like to get a degree. Um, now, when I get boys, or men, I'm very interested because the men come from a different background, a different history, and what the men have had to do, often, uh, because we live in a society that still has particular prejudice against male dancing, um, they've had to kind of subvert their way and um, uh, justify their being in dance. And so if this has worked, I will now show you some male dancing. 
the nature of the piece, and again, I purposely didn't want you to have too much of the sound, um, because the nature of the piece is a conflict, and I wanted you to kind of see that. It's a conflict resolution, and um, it's about different kind of gang rivalry and points of view. Um, and they started by doing all their own kind of research into identity and maleness, so-called stereotypical maleness and so on. And this is kind of where the piece came. Um, I could talk much more about that, but I want to just tell you a little bit more about what I've been doing. Um, so, um, I've talked to a lot of students about what they see as an enabling environment. Now, in very simple terms, of course, this is very complex, in very simple terms, they just want this stuff. Um, so they just want, you know, a physical environment where they have a sense of belonging to a place or a space. Okay, it sounds very straightforward. And so the kinds of, you know, quotations that I've had are things like, I don't want to feel vulnerable or exposed. Well, the very nature of dance is you are there as a body and you are very exposed and you are very vulnerable. And you have to get used to feeling that, particularly if you want to perform because you have an audience who are looking at you. Um, no matter whether you're doing site-specific installation or theater, you know, you're, you, that's what you are. You're there to be seen and you um, want to be seen in that kind of strange tension way whereas actually you don't want to feel valuable or exposed. So, you know, what we take for granted in terms of just having a physical space, whether it is in process or product uh, performance, is that actually um, you, they want to feel as though they, they are um, confident, uh, able to take risks in an environment. In terms of emotions, um, it's what we kind of term the invisible measure of feelings. So we and I certainly have done this, we make a lot of assumptions about that we're setting up this wonderful environment and everybody feels really comfortable and cosy, but actually, there's a lot of other stuff going on. Um, you know, stuff with us as tutors that we have to kind of leave at the door as a professional, stuff with our adolescent group. Um, and again, you know, they want to feel confident to try things out, and we've already talked about how peers um, can uh, empower people to take risks, or how they can um, perhaps make people not want to take risks. So the peer group is really, really important. In terms of social things, um, it's expectations in terms of attitudes and values and relationships. They want to have something in common with the rest of the people they're in the room with. Um, I want to feel I'm a friend, I'm with friends who have something in common with, uh, who I can trust. And in terms of the sort of, you know, what I've termed kind of cognitive body learning, they want the support, challenge, and motivation. Or do they? <laughs> we assume, again, um, that they want to feel that they're improving and learning. But actually, you know, that, that's actually more tricky than we think it is. Um, and, and so I've put there, you know, relating to Bourdieu, um, we often take these things for granted. We make a lot of assumptions. Um, and we make assumptions because I'm suggesting, and certainly in the research I've been doing, that we forget that we all come with this embodied identity. And uh, I talk with the students a lot about how everybody walks around with a little rucksack of experience on their back. And they can't get rid of that rucksack of experience. And everything that they have experienced up until the point where they meet, you know, me, um, is in that rucksack of experience. And they see the world in that way. Um, and so it kind of starts at the bottom. These experiences are, you know, really, really important. I mean, you can look at psychology um, uh, and sociology here, but, you know, how we relate to the world from a very ba young baby is, is going to matter. Um, perceptions, how we see the world, how we relate to the world, how we make interpretations of the world. Um, and those histories. So I come with my own history, and I see the world in that way. And yes, I've, you know, had a little rebellion on the way. I've taken some risks. I've problem solved in certain ways to get to where I am now. Um, but, you know, we're still working with kind of 18 to 22 year olds predominantly who have a set of ex experiences, perceptions and histories um, which they will relate to the world with. And it's up to us to sort of help them feel comfortable to start questioning those things um, as they're developing their knowledge, skills and understanding with us. And so in terms of enabling environment, um, we've talked about experiential learning a lot today already, or certainly experienced it. Um, I've, I've related to uh, Bourdieu in terms of this sort of socially, um, culturally constructed environment, 
that actually we cannot deny that we all come with what uh, Bourdieu calls the habitus, the number of habitai, um, and that there's this inter interaction between intelligence of individuals um, and the multiple intelligences. But what I'm looking at particularly here is um, Vygotsky's work on the sort of more knowledgeable other, enabling other. Um, but, but like us all today, I do see teaching as a creative act in itself and learning being a creative way of um, developing oneself. So creativity as a way of facilitating and managing change and development is what I try and do with the students that I work with and with myself as well. Um, so in terms of pedagogies, scaffolded or spiral learning, um, so drawing on Bruner's work, where um, we build from where the students are. Now, of course, that's really tricky when um, we're thinking about uh, coverage in modules and we're thinking about assessments and working towards particular degree classifications. But um, if we you know, maybe don't get bogged down with so much sort of coverage and we just sort of you know, look at where the students are and think about the processes of learning, um, I found that that's been really helpful in terms of giving space to be creative, space to think, space to reflect. Um, and although it's not necessarily what the students expect all the time, it actually really shows a development when they get to year three um, because it's about facilitation and interaction with enabling others. And the enabling others isn't just us as tutors. Um, it isn't about us and our egos, um, you know, and showing that we're kind of the best performer or the best technical dancer. Uh, it's actually about them realising that act all of us can learn from each other. And when we kind of develop that environment, um, and certainly that boys or male group that you saw, you know, they have come up with lots and lots of creative, creative ideas by taking that playful approach, by taking risk with each other, by, you know, lifting each other, exploring uh, lots of different ways of making that movement to make meaning to an audience. And so they've had that opportunity where I've given them some sort of different creative tasks and they've come up with um, something which shows that process. But it's progressive and, of course, not all students flow in the same way. So year ones I sort of see as kind of more dependent, if you like. We do a lot of hand-holding and support. Year two is kind of my interdependent, if you like, using Vygotsky's and Bruno's spiral. Um, and year three, I want them to become more independent. I want them to go out and um, explore the world for themselves politically, socially, and so on. Um, so I'm trying to develop this community of practice. Um, I'm trying to make it immersive. I'm trying to develop sort of habits and attitudes, which are kind of creative habits and attitudes, really focusing on relationships and collaborations and how important they are. Um, seeing being creative and space to play as being valuable um, and academic in its own right, that process of learning is playful, um, and, and working on sort of individual collaborative ways of exploring, problem solving, and so on. Um, so there isn't really time to go through this one, but I'll, there was a quotation there from one of the students that was talking about um, their experiences. So in terms of challenges, of course, you know, it's wonderful, it all flows and it all works really well, but it doesn't always work so well. There are always challenges along the way. We always meet students, don't we, that don't um, find it so easy uh, to uh, relate to group members or um, step out of their comfort zone and take a risk. And of course, the challenges are, again, student motivations and embodied identities. Um, so perceptions, how students see the world. Um, Students obviously are very focused on achievement and they want to gain a degree, a particular type of classification of degree. So that's always in the back of their mind. Um, and sometimes if something is not assessed, we don't get as much engagement with it. Um, this notion of risk and a risk for one person may not be the same as a risk for another person. Resilience is really important, of course, because, you know, if a student gets a particular mark of a 2-2 and they expect a first, they need to, to have lots and lots of feedback and, and build the resilience as to why they may have got that and understand that, you know, can't always um, get, get what you want, um, but know why and reflect on why. Uh, thinking about aspirations, so again, I spoke very briefly at the beginning about the nature of the students that come into me, and they are often 
students who don't see themselves as academic. They see themselves as very practical, and they've been told they're very practical. And it's really helping them be aspirational and realise, actually, when they're researching to make a piece of dance, it's the same process as if you're writing a piece of narrative or you're writing an essay. You know, you're still um, researching, you're still drafting, redrafting, editing, um, and working on selecting, rejecting material. Um, it's the same kind of process. And when students sort of start seeing that, um, the world of making and creation, um, things start clicking into place and they become more aspirational and realise that actually they can um, write. Um, and then finally, this sort of understanding that, you know, when you come to university, it's about personal development. It's not just about getting particular marks in assessments or getting a particular type of degree. It's about how you change, how you take risks, how you're flexible um, and how indeed you embrace every opportunity.